Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Korea Society. I'm so happy to have you here. My name is Nikita Desai. I'm the Director for Policy and Corporate Programs here. And uh, we've been doing a series of programs on entrepreneurship and innovation um, in Korea for a very long time, for about three years now. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back, Bernard, and to welcome you, Alon, here for the first time. So, Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll briefly just introduce our two speakers. Uh, Bernard is co-founder and partner at both Spark Labs Global Ventures as well as Spark Labs. Uh, Spark Labs is focused on uh, a start, was a startup accelerator in Korea, and he will talk a little bit more about Spark Labs Global Ventures to us. Previously, he was the CEO um, and co-founder at VidQuick. It was a web conferencing and sales solutions platform. He founded a number of startups and has raised over 50 million in venture capital. He enjoys helping other entrepreneurs as much as possible. Um, and our second speaker here, Elan Avesera, originally from France, is a second time entrepreneur based in New York City since 2004. He is now founder and CEO at Incensi, they're makers of Illy, which we will learn about uh, in our program today. It's a new kind of communication device and a platform for families. Elan's first company was Productive, one of the leading task management platforms for teams. Elan is also an angel investor in a number of companies, but more importantly, he's a proud dad of three, which he, he enjoys uh, talking to a lot on, on Illy. So um, please give them a, a big round of applause and a warm welcome. Thank you. So Bernard Moon, welcome back to the Korea Society yeah, stage. Thanks for inviting me. We had you uh, in 2013 when you had, were just about to launch Spark Labs, uh, the accelerator, the startup accelerator in Korea. We, or had, had started. We already started. We had, you yeah, had started. we already started, yeah. Um, so tell us what has <clears throat> happened uh, in the last few years, uh, a little bit more about Spark Labs Global Ventures. I know that uh, you've grown now to focus on companies uh, on the global level. Yeah, so I think it was good timing when we launched Spark Labs end of, <laughs> end of 2012, because also with President Park's initiative of this creative economy, um, we also grew. I mean, there was already a growing interest before her policy programs in entrepreneurship in Korea, mm -hmm. and then it just sort of exploded. And then so we obviously grew along with that. Since then, uh, now we're on our sixth batch. I think when we talked, we were on our second. That's right, yeah. And then um, now our demo days have become the largest in the world. Um, the past two, over 14 and 1,500 people attended. We've had, this past December, over 450 investors from throughout Asia. And, then we, and our branding has become uh, you know, strong, not just within Korea, but also regionally and somewhat globally. So we get applicants now from 20 different countries throughout the world. Wow. Um, a lot of the companies are further along than most other accelerators in the world. On average, they've raised over 400,000 before they enter the program. Uh, we've had 48 graduates so far, and in terms of equity value, it's now over 660 million. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of them are doing well. And then our follow-on rate, which is what you know, after the program, do they raise money? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it's at about, I think, 76%. So wow. the leading in the world is Y Combinator, based in Silicon Valley. That's a little over 90%. So for sure, we're top five, maybe top three globally. Mm -hmm. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can we have a look at a little bit of what Demo Day looks like? And can you tell us who are the people that come to these uh, open open events? Are they open? Are they closed? Yeah, so we keep it open because uh, we're still trying to grow the ecosystem in Korea and in Asia. Um, so we we, <laughs> we have been debating whether to make it invite only, but we think it's good for the ecosystem and the energy. So like I said, um, this past December, 1,500 people came. Uh, over 450 were investors from throughout the region. And then the rest are entrepreneurs, a lot of corp dev guys from Huawei, ZTE, to a lot of Japanese conglomerates, uh, uh, Mitsui, mm -hmm. and then obviously the local Korean ones, SK, SK Telecom, Samsung, LG, et cetera. Okay, so. great. So should we have a look at the demo day video? Uh, sure.
Was this the most recent? Yeah. In 2015. So tell us a little bit more about the next accelerator that you're launching, which is uh, Internet of Things Accelerator. Um, and why you chose Songdo and Seoul for the for the launch of it? So um, yeah, we have two expansion plans. I mean, the past year and a half, we've had a lot of random inquiries to launch our accelerator in Eastern Europe, to Malaysia, to Singapore, to Taipei, Hong Kong. Um, this year, we're eyeing uh, launching Spark Labs in Beijing. So we're talking with a okay. few partners there, and then the more immediate one is. The IoT program, which has been in the works, but finally, um, we wouldn't have taken government money, but the government came in with some support without strings attached. So they're actually investing in the program, and then wow. uh, so we're launching. We were targeting May, but I think we pushed it back because uh, June is our demo day. So that's just a big event. So we'll probably make it July, August, and our thesis around that is that um, some of the best hardware engineers in the world are in Seoul and Taipei. Mm. So we want to sort of tap that potential funnel and draw them out um, because we do believe you know, the next big wave is IoT and hardware. Mm -hmm. And in certain areas, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's still very early, mm -hmm. but we think it's good to sort of draw out interest. Because uh, generalizing, I would say hardware engineers are way more conservative than software guys. Right, so we just want to slowly sort of draw them out of Samsung and LG. And, and we've seen that movement already because there's been seven hardware companies that have gone through a regular accelerator program. And um, probably about maybe 30 or 40 that have applied. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of the, a lot of these guys, like our sort of guess was, are coming out of Samsung and LG mm -hmm. to start their own thing. So. Mm -hmm. so, Do you think there's an increased momentum and wanting to start your own uh, startup versus you know, going to work for a large company? Yeah, I think that's happened over the past several years. And then there's been a mind shift, not just in terms of the entrepreneurs, they've matured, I think. They're not just looking to get acquired by the larger companies, but they have a vision to go global, right? And that's, I think, helped out with you know, the first wave of internet companies like Nexon and NHN doing well. And then there's not even Kakao and then an NHN spinoff with Line. Um, so there's definitely been sort of this mind shift. And it's not just, you know, software developers from, from uh, whatever, from Samsung or, or other companies, but now it's like, you know, from everywhere, from like, you know, local foreign offices, like we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs from like Goldman and McKinsey leave the offices in Seoul to try to start their own things. Mm -hmm. So there's, a, there's definitely a movement towards entre entrepreneurship across the board. Mm -hmm. so. Well, tell us more about what this trend is, the Internet of Things, they're also referred to as IoT. Um, Spark Labs, you know, your Global Ventures just released a report, uh, the industry report and overview, and we actually <coughs> have uh, it out for distribution if you wanted to pick up a copy. It's also available online. But just walk us through, tell us a little bit more about why this is a trend, why it's growing, why it's important for Korea. Yeah, um, well, background. So we launched a, a global seed stage fund uh, in end of 2013. We partnered with two outside people. And then instead of Korea Focus or Asia Focus, we made it a global fund. We've been one of the more global, active global investors or seed stage investors in the world. We've done now 55 investments uh, across five continents. Uh, primarily since we're a new fund, about 20 of them have been in Silicon Valley. And so we do like IoT. Uh, we joke around, we say that we invest in anything online, not illegal, saying it's a very broad <laughs> range. But uh, we are very active in IoT, whether it's 
uh, consumer and industrial, but so far we've only invested in six consumer plays with uh, Ilan's company being one of them. And so the trends that we see, I mean, I won't go, I'll just show like three or four slides. Um, so I, I, IoT is, uh, is I, I assume some, most of you are familiar with it, it's just basically connected devices, whether it's consumer or sensors on, on the manufacturing or industrial side. And so everything, as everything goes online, um, there's this whole opportunity of all the data that's connected and connectivity within people, within companies, people to companies, et cetera. So that's why we see it as just a big opportunity because there's so many, um, there's so much sort of unknowns that could occur as more things come online. And so we see uh, a division between consumer and industrial. Those are like the two big opportunities. And if you go down within consumer, we see, uh, we've identified five big areas, uh, connected home, wearables, which you're familiar with, with iWatch, et cetera, uh, healthcare, robotics and drones, and transportation. Um, so within industrial IoT, we also see uh, three big areas. One is artificial intelligence, which you might know on the sort of PR publicity side with deep minds. AlphaGo recently beating the world Go champion in Korea. Uh, <coughs> security, and then also sensor-driven uh, computing. So then I'll just go to our program that we're launching. So I think there's some people, might be some people from Gale International. We have Tom or Kat here, yeah. OK, Thank so um, Gale was the main uh, real estate developer for this uh, smart city that's uh, right outside of Incheon. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, for those of you that are not familiar, Songdo is one of two smart cities that's built from the ground up. And um, currently they have 80,000 apartment units. I think it's right under 40,000 residents right now. I think they're, it's, they're hoping for more, maybe like 70, but it's still a good number. And we've uh, partnered with Gale and then also Cisco and other companies to launch our program uh, there this summer. So we're, we're excited about it. I think we'll start small, maybe target three to six companies, um, whether it's consumer or industrial facing. And it'll be a global program, so we'll do global recruitment for those companies that are interested in, uh, in going through our IoT Accelerator program. How does that work exactly? So if a company is interested, what are the next steps and what are sort of the, you know, the, the program specifics of how to go through, how to be a test bed for uh, technology in Songdo? Yeah, so the, the main focus, it's a six-month program and we invest, uh, it'll probably be at least 50000 and for a small percent. So most accelerated programs, even our flagship, it, you know, we only invest twenty five k. They don't they don't really need our money. Like I said, they've on average already raised 400,000. So they don't need our 25K. It's mainly access to our network of mentors and, and uh, team. Mm -hmm. And even the first two classes in Spark Labs, uh, some people have a misconception. They think accelerator, what's different accelerator versus incubator? Incubator is usually, you know, workspace, business plan, you know, very early guidance. Mm -hmm. And accelerator really is accelerating existing business. Mm -hmm. And so, most of the companies in our first two classes, they didn't even need office space from us. Like that's like the least important. Hmm. It, it's really about access to the team and network. So that's what we're really focused on is bringing in uh, companies and entrepreneurs with uh, great products and helping them just build it. Mm -hmm. And then obviously connecting them with opportunities, whether in Songdo or elsewhere in our network. Mm -hmm. Now, are most of the companies that are part of the IoT Accelerator, are they software-based? Are they software companies or are they hardware companies? I think majority will be hardware companies, um, just, the way, just the way the landscape works out. But then we are also looking at software plays. Um, it could be uh, operating systems. It could be AI plays, especially in industrial uh, in Internet of Things. There's a lot of AI-driven plays, you know, because... There's so much data that's collected from these different sensors at manufacturing sites, et cetera. Um, what do you do with it? And that's what AI and machine learning does. It allows you to obviously sort through the data 
and gain new insights from it. So we think AI is, is definitely the critical piece in industrial Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. so. Now, I think this is a good time to kind of switch over to you, Alon. You've made that transition from your first company to now to uh, working on Illy. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that was like, um, how you came to? To do hardware. Yeah, to do hardware. So um, my first company was, yeah, 100% uh, software. In the meantime, so that was between 2008 and 2012. In the meantime, um, hardware startup were starting really to... Uh, to grow, it was a little bit less expensive to build hardware. You had, you know, accelerators actually starting to focus also on hardware, giving mentorship, uh, easier access to uh, contract manufacturers in Asia, company like Dragon Innovation, PCH, those guys, that, that's what they do for a living. And so um, it started to be uh, a little bit more affordable to look at hardware. Now, uh, I wasn't really specifically looking to build a hardware company. I was interested in the problem and uh, around family communications. And I felt like the answer uh, to me was a hybrid of a hardware and software solution. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I came into uh, hardware. Obviously, you need to do that, to do that with uh, a hardware team, very strong engineers. Those are harder to find. Uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, embedded software, those are very rare uh, talents. And so when I assembled that initial team, I, I felt like we were ready to start building hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us more about the product that you're working on? Sure. So it's called Illy, I-L-Y. Um, and we're building essentially a new kind of home phone um, that's targeting specifically younger kids, so kids under 10. 95% um, of kids under 10 don't have a phone, uh, and also sometimes uh, older adults. So it could be older grandparents when tech is too complicated for them, when they struggle with FaceTime, with Skype, or with iPads in general. So think of it as a, a new connected uh, home phone with, uh, I think we'll, we'll show a video so people can see what it looks like, but touch screen, video camera, and essentially, the vision is to build uh, kind of the, the WhatsApp or Messenger or uh, WeChat, but for families. Mm -hmm. And to bring all of the families into Ely, so we're actually helping families building, you know, family networks on Ely, we feel like we need to bring in the extremities of the family, uh, which are younger kids and older grandparents, which, which most of the time are not connected. And that's why we're building a hardware component to our platform so we can actually connect them and let my kids send uh, a drawing to their grandparents or a video message, a picture, or just do video chat with them without the parents uh, being involved uh, in the equation. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good time. Should we take a look at the video? If Peter could line it up for us. We need sound. Your blood. Ah, oh, there it is. Your sweet pea. Your family. You're a ragtag bunch flying the same flag with a language all your own. <coughs> but you're not always under the same roof. <coughs> and it's not easy to stay connected. Oh, hi, Dad. I'm totally doing my best here. Hello. What if there was a device that brought everyone in your family together? Hello? Introducing Illy, the first family phone. Illy is a window that allows you to see, hear, has the yellow submarine. and share the most important things with Whoa. just the people that matter most. doesn't do a million things. It does just one thing perfectly. Hi, honey bunny. Hi, Grandma. Bring everyone in your family together, all in one place. It's a, it's a really great device. I think I want to <coughs> get one. <laughs> um, I heard you were going to be retailing it at $199. That's, yes. That's coming up this summer. Yes. So in um, coming up with the concept of such a product, I mean, what were the challenges that you faced and uh, how many trial runs did you have to do? Uh, how did you select your engineers? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot more difficult to build hardware, especially for us because we also build software on it, right? So when you look at the Internet of Things trend or smart home connected devices, most of them, if you think about it, it's 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 a piece of plastic with some electronic inside, uh, and then it works with a mobile app. That's what we call connected devices. So it talks to my iPhone or my Android phone, and I can control my thermostat. But in our case, we are building an actual uh, operating system on Ely, which is obviously based on uh, a big one, Android, that we can customize. So it's our own distribution of Android, and we have three engineers, three embedded software engineers doing just that, customizing Android for Ely. Uh, so it doesn't look uh, like Android at all. That's a lot of work. Uh, and again, you don't have many engineers able to tweak an operating system. So just like Kindle Fire is doing it, you know, they have their own Android version. Um, so hiring when you have uh, a big market, when you're looking at solving a problem that speaks to many people is easier. Uh, for us, it wasn't too difficult to hire and it's still pretty easy. We get resume pretty often. Also in New York, you don't have tons of hardware startups. So when you're a good hardware engineer, you know there's there may be I don't know ten startups that will get most of those resume uh, in New York. That's growing very fast though. Um, and the other big challenge for any hardware startup is funding, because you need a lot more money to bring a product to market than obviously launching just an app. Uh, you need to go to China or in Asia to find your contract manufacturer. You need to set up production. You need to do multiple pre-production runs that cost lots of money. Uh, so it's a lot of capex. Um, and I would say on average, to be able to launch uh, a hardware product to the market, you would need anywhere between like 2.5 to 8, 10 million uh, to get to a point where you know you have early numbers of traction and, and sales. I don't know if that's your experience as yeah. well, but it's yeah. rarely <coughs> under two, three million. Really, mm -hmm. it's really hard to do mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Did you want to add something? No, no. Oh, okay. Hardware is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Hardware is hard. Um, I, I noticed that there might, and we talked a little bit about this, but is there a trend moving from software to hardware, more companies being more comfortable or more hardware engineers being more comfortable in launching uh, a product that is a hardware product? Yes. Yeah. A lot more people are interested in hardware. Um, more entrepreneurs are looking at hardware products, but also you see a lot of, you know, dead companies before they could launch a product. And that's why you have great platform like, you know, Indiegogo, uh, Kickstarter, well, we're mostly helping bridge that gap between you get that great idea, uh, how do I bring the first hundreds of units into the hands of customers, and how do I um, figure out if there's traction, if there's interest for my product before I spend $3 million on it. And so that, that's a good indicator. Kickstarter started a few years ago. Uh, for those who don't know Kickstarter, it's like the biggest crowdfunding platform, mostly for hardware products, but you can crowdfund pretty much anything. Now the way uh, investors and, and, and even, I would say, entrepreneurs are seeing Kickstarter, it's a bit different than four years ago. Like when Pebble launched on Kickstarter, uh, they actually, they are the company who probably helped launch Kickstarter because it was a super successful campaign, a few million dollars raised, um, it was a lot easier for them to raise VC money after that success. Today, it's a bit different. And, and I think investors are looking for more than just a successful uh, Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. um, they are looking for real traction outside of the early adopters uh, crowd, which is hard to do. So yes, more people are looking at hardware companies. A lot more people are using Raspberry Pi and all of those things to build first prototypes of their products. But there are still lots of barriers uh, to build a hardware company. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, what I'm hearing a lot is, is hardware companies are harder to build. There's a little bit more risk involved. Um, it's more expensive to raise the capital um, for launching it successfully. So, Bernard, you know, knowing Korea, you've been operating there in that field uh, for a few years now. Can you tell us a little bit more about the startup culture in Korea? You know, it is or the risk averse nature um is that a factor in korea for hardware startups 
Uh, I, I think or is there a hard... startup culture that's a little different yeah, in Korea than it is in Silicon Valley, for instance? Um, so, so the startup ecosystem has been changing. Like I said, there's definitely a shift towards entrepreneurship mm -hmm. even before we launched, probably like two or three years before, where more and more people were interested in entrepreneurship. And then um, it's, it's also a shift because that's the only reason why <clears throat> when my co-founder Hanju asked me to launch Spark Labs, the accelerator, um, I saw a trend a few years before with all these entrepreneurs from Korea, either through friends or randomly pinging me, hey, can we meet up? Um, there's a mind shift because before they would just think, hey, I could take my product in Korea and plop it down into the US, right? Which sounds stupid now, but back then they actually thought that. And so now they're obviously more savvy. They, they, they want to localize it, do the actual proper research, et cetera. And more, more and more entrepreneurs are obviously, especially these 20-somethings in Korea, are bilingual. More and more have studied abroad in the US or UK or wherever. Um, so, there's, so there's definitely a shift in also the talent base. And like I said, now it's not just people coming out of, uh, straight out of school, but out of Samsung, and then now like, you know, larger companies, McKinsey, Goldman, et cetera, whatever, right? They're all shifting towards entrepreneurship. So it's mm -hmm. definitely, an in thing in Korea now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I forgot the latest count. I think it's something like 30,000 startups, wow. right? And then we're only one of uh, a couple uh, dozen, I would say, accelerators there, right? So there's a lot of accelerator and seed activity. There's decent Series A, and then there's pretty good mid, mid stage investments. So the, the whole ecosystem in Korea is developing. I would say within Asia, it's probably number two after China. Obviously, it doesn't have the scale of China, but in ter terms of maturity, Korea is number two after China. So. Okay. Yeah, and to add to that, actually, I think that investors in, in Korea, China are a lot more uh, interested and less cared about hardware than in the U.S. or in Europe in general. Like most investors in the, in, in the U.S. who are not focused on hardware, we tell you we don't do any hardware investment because we don't have tons of success stories of big hardware companies in the US, obviously everybody talks about Apple, but Apple is you know, the biggest company in the world. While uh, in Asia, we have lots of success stories. We have companies like Xiaomi, they, they were born like a few years ago, and now they're giants. Um, so wh when, when you speak with you know, Asian-based investors, they're not scared about uh, funding hardware companies. So that's another big like, advantage of being based uh, there, I think. Do you see a lot of international investors draw to Korea uh, more and more? Is that a trend that's also going up? Yeah, that's definitely a trend. I, I think people see the activity within Korea, whether it's hardware or software. Um, you know, there is that talent base there. Uh, there's still things that need to develop, but... Um, like? Like uh, certain types of talent. I would say Korea is world-class in terms of uh, software developers and UI, UX. Uh, they might not be strong in terms of general management and product management. So what you might see is a Korean development team with designers and developers partner with uh, maybe a product guy in the US. And then they sort of package that together. Mm. Um, that's what actually one of my co-founders did, uh, Jimmy, who was Nexon's. Nexon is the largest online gaming company in Korea. He was their first CFO. He took a dev team out of Nexon, partnered them with a former product head of EA uh, and then they launched the company and they, they sold it to Disney. Um, so you see some of that. Um, going back to your uh, question, I think about like interest from foreign investors. Yeah, yeah, so even within our portfolio on our accelerator side, we've had Qualcomm VC from San Diego invest. Yahoo Japan has done their first Korean investments into mm. one of our companies. Uh, now we get a lot of uh, <laughs> Hong Kong billionaires come to our demo days, the wealthiest <laughs> families in Indonesia. So there's a lot of interest and in, uh, draw towards Korea. Uh, I, I think it's a combination of factors too. It's not just tech, but because Korea sort of has this like cultural imperialism in Asia, from K-pop to to dramas mm -hmm. to beauty. So I think that's all sort of helped Korea sort of propel forward. So. Right. Well, that's great. Please join me in thanking our two speakers today. Yeah.